unpredictability at the beginning of a pandemic crisis. I would say the perfect storm, unfortunately. The first case of COVID-19 was confirmed on March 4th, and on March 3rd, and on March 4th, what we saw was a government reshuffle that brought again new faces to the forefront and more turbulences, such as the dismissal of Prosecutor General Reboshapka, which was assessed as damaging Ukraine's uh, reform track record. Um, just a few days ago, the IMF has worsened the outlook for Ukraine's economy uh, for 2020. In particular, the GDP drop uh, from 7.7 .7 to 8.2, as was predicted in April. It will start uh, growing again only in 2021, and that by only 1.1%. In addition, we also see predictions for uh, high unemployment rates. Uh, it will fluctuate, according to the IMF, also around 12% for the next two years. So based on what Zelensky has achieved or failed to do so far amidst uh, these ongoing political developments and this bleak um, economic outlook, we will try to assess today uh, who's driving the policymaking process, what can we expect in terms of domestic reform progress and foreign policy directions from the remaining term of um, the president and uh, his team. Just as a disclaimer, uh, we will not speak today about the war in Donbass and prospects of achieving peace that much since it is a very vast topic in itself and also not fully in the hands of the Ukrainians themselves. However, if you do, questions, uh, do have questions, I encourage you to raise them in the Q&A uh, session. Um, with that said, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, with us Katarina Madarnova, the Acting Director of EU Support Group for Ukraine and Deputy Director General, the engineer from the European Commission. Katarina, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we also have with us Manuel Zaratzin, MP in the German Bundestag, spokesman on Eastern European Affairs of the Green Party. As always, great to have you, Manuel. Uh, Susan Stewart, Head of Research Division uh, on Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, Eurasia at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. Again, thank you for accepting our invite, Susan. It's always nice to have you. And last but not the least, Irina Solonenko, who's an Associate Fellow with us at the DJP uh, and with who we wrote recently a paper on rule of law reform during Zelensky's first year in office. Welcome, Irina, to you too. Before we start uh, with the intro remarks in a, a short discussion with, uh, with the four speakers, I would like to ask my colleague uh, Marina Sonceva to quickly give us a 10 seconds IT notice uh, on uh, what, can, what, what can we expect from today, like unmuting your microphones, please. <coughs> Irina, you have, uh, uh, Marina, you have the floor. Uh, dear all, also welcome from my side. Here are the um, housekeeping rules uh, for the Zoom call for today. Uh, if you want to ask the question or make the uh, comment, just write uh, a short plus sign in the chat. Or you may uh, also use the raise your hand button. You will find uh, the uh, raise the hand and button in the participant list. Just give us the sign and we will give the floor to you. While you're speaking, don't forget to unmute yourself. We have put you on mute automatically for now. And you may also switch between the gallery view and the speaker view in the upper right corner of the screen as it is most convenient for you. And we are also recording the event and we are having a YouTube live stream and I will provide you the YouTube link into the chat and please uh, feel free to share it with your colleagues who could not join us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. Um, as I mentioned, we will start with a few rounds of short questions to the speakers and move to the Q&A. Um, so we have uh, in a way grouped questions around three blocks today. We cannot look into the future. Um, Marina, I think you're sharing your screen with us. If you could uh, turn that off, um, please. 
that would be nice. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, grouped our questions today into three different uh, um, into two into three different categories. One is looking briefly back uh, at the achievements and um, 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 let's say. Um, reform progress in Ukraine to be able to then comment on what do we expect next. We also want to look at domestic actors and the decision making process and finally at the foreign policy directions uh, for Ukraine uh, in the next one to two years. Uh, with that said, I would like to start with uh, Katarina uh, by uh, asking you, how do you um, see the reforms underta undertaken during the first year of Zelensky? Which ones do you see, Katarina, as being the most successful ones for Ukraine? Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the GAPE first for organizing uh, this uh, webinar and also for inviting me. Uh, now that I wear the double hat of my de deputy director general job and the head of the support group, uh, I, can, I can delve into matters of Ukraine even deeper than I, than I uh, already used to. So it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, well, first, let me, let me look at the... Um, uh, let me look at the uh, first year of Zelensky from, from the following perspective. He came into office with a huge promise of uh, uh, bringing economic prosperity, ending war in Donbas, and, uh, and stopping corruption and oligarchic interests. Uh, this was uh, certainly much, much easier said than done. Uh, setting high goals is, is, is always good, but uh, I think we are now seeing a situation where uh, the regime and the, and, the, and the transformation in Ukraine is getting into a normal, uh, more normal pace. Because Zelensky started with uh, what, what everybody dubbed turbo, uh, turbo regime of a uh, tremendous number of reforms uh, adopted in the, in the first uh, four months uh, or five months of the, of the office. And these were extremely important. Uh, essentially, the whole economic uh, area got re-regulated uh, and a lot of things that were stuck for three years uh, under the previous uh, government suddenly got unblocked because of the large uh, majority that uh, Zelensky had in the parliament, just to name the few, was, uh, was a big facilitation of trade and customs, concessions law, market surveillance law, uh, banking uh, regulation law, um, and law on economic operators, etc. So this really gave, uh, gave the initial very strong impetus. Uh, along with that came energy uh, reforms. Uh, finally, we got the unbundling uh, the, 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 the split into the different component parts uh, of the NAFTA gas, the gas monopoly, something again that was very, very difficult to uh, get through. And also um, initially there were very important steps in the rule of law area uh, that got passed, which was the recriminalization of illicit enrichment. Uh, it was the relaunching of the National Agency for, corruption, uh, for Prevention of Corruption, uh, wi allowing wiretapping by NABU, the celebrated uh, anti-corruption investigation agency, and also making operational the High Anti-Corruption Court, which was selected also with the, with the support of the international community, including the EU. So there was really I would say an unsustainable level of, uh, of uh, uh, reform activity. And, and, and that's, when, that's when we came into the new year, uh, uh, some of the oligarchic interests started uh, bubbling, bubbling up again, and then came the COVID crisis. Katarina, so, if, if and I can I stop, stop you here. here. Yeah, yes. we, and then we came will the go. COVID crisis. And uh, so I think, a lot has been achieved in the COVID crisis, land law and banking law got uh, adopted and, and he spent a lot of political capital, but of course, concerns for the future remain. And with that, I think uh, Mr. Starazan is going to come in on what was not achieved, right? 
Yeah, thank you, Katarina. Before, let me ask Susan. Susan, do you agree with Katarina's assessment? What, what do you make of Zelensky's most important achievements uh, this year? Uh, well, I agree in large part. I, I, I agree that um, in terms of this uh, entire economic block of reforms, it's been uh, very important that this has that ha this has continued. That some things have been unblocked, as Katarina said, and uh, I think it's been important that the national bank has remained independent and that the the macroeconomic situation has. Um, I mean, now we're in a different phase, but at the, at the beginning, sort of last second half of last year, uh, was able to remain uh, fairly stable. Uh, I, I also agree that the unbundling was was a huge milestone in the energy reform. Um, I. I think it's also important to, to point out that uh, decentralization reform has been able to continue. Um, that's important on many levels because it has effects on the economic um, development of communities, also on their democratic development and on uh, the fight against corruption. Uh, and I, I would say that it's not, it's even though you said we're not going to talk about the Donbass and it's not really a reform area, I still think it's important to at least mention uh, the impetus that was given in the in the second half of last year by Zelensky and his team in terms of the new bridge in Stanislav Luhanska, in terms of the prisoner exchanges, in terms of the disengagement in three areas. So leading up also to the Normandy 4 summit in Paris. So I think that should at least be, be mentioned and acknowledged here. Um, one concern perhaps if, that I have is that because of this turbo mode and also now because of the extreme external pressure from the IMF and the need, uh, the desperate need in Ukraine to have IMF funding, uh, my fear is that uh, there will be a, an acceleration of a trend that we've seen in the past, which is that you have laws, but then uh, when you get to the implement state, Im implementation stage, uh, you run into major problems because there are uh, vested interests that are actually against those reforms. Thanks, Susan. Um, now that we kind of set the scene for the positive achievements, and there have been many, as both of you have, uh, have mentioned, uh, Manuel, could you tell us from your perspective, uh, looking at the other side of the, of the coin, if we look back at this first year of Zelensky, which reforms are lagging behind or which ones are seriously lagging behind in your view? Yeah, so I think there are mainly two sectors which I would underline the one is quite classical i would say it's the justice system rule of law fight against corruption sector and the second one is the political scene which i would um, put in two pieces which is the political culture and the institutions and as we see that in the beginning of the presidency of mr zelensky and also his new government and the parliament majority was of course we saw some um, rapid achievements, I think, also regarding the justice system. Um, Madame Matanova just uh, elaborated on. But now we also saw with the dismissal of Mr. Jakub Shako um, and uh, also the new pressure on the NABU that um, uh, Zelensky seems to have a different course also in this topic. And it's more or less coming to the old fashioned style of, to a certain extent, political use of. Um, the prosecution uh, for political purposes and influence from parliament and oligarch uh, on um, prosecution. So I think that this is a major point where we see actually a bit like with Mr. Poroshenko, how the presidency, have, how this in the presidency outlooks can be changing. And I think this is also a sign of, um, you know, kind of uh, the new guy who tries to cope with the old system, but uh, I think to a certain extent he gave up to change some of the major columns of the political system of Ukraine. And I fear that parts of corruption and parts of the oligarch system isn't going to change. The second point with the political institutions and the political culture, I think it is really major. From the beginning on, Zelensky was kind of guy who said like, I will kick all the backs in the country and show you that change is possible. And um, let's say this seems to be positive, but on the other hand, it's a classical problem of post-Soviet countries that they always believe in the one messiah who will kick enough backs to bring all the good about the country. And actually this is a classical way into a typical post 
Soviet kind of leadership with the father of fatherland, who's this time really young enough to not be a grandfather of the fatherland. And I think uh, Zelensky was showing from the beginning this kind of um, trust only in himself and the close circles around him in the presidential administration. This got even stronger. And he, from the beginning on, didn't want to have other institutions like parliament or like constitutional courts or like uh, independent institution regarding corruption to become too strong, but also regarding government. So you could make a joke like, where you have a worse job as a prime minister in Russia or in Ukraine, it's a hard competition. Um, but I think this is a structural problem. The culture of him to, to all deciding on himself, the influence on him, which is strong from different directions, where I think in the beginning we had this, we had a small over, um, pressure or small over advantage from the reformist side and now we see that old oligarchs are coming back on this on the scene. Let's speak and about the oligarchs just a little bit uh, later, uh, Manuel, but I would like to, so you raised two important points here, the lack of investing or building stronger institutions and also the lack of investing more or changing the political culture. I think this also in a way brings the question, you know, is this feasible as an expectation for, for one year, but definitely the, the impulse that one gives from the presidential seat is, is very important. Let me ask Irina uh, here, uh, um, what do you think? Do you agree with, with uh, Manuel's assessment uh, on, on, on this? And maybe you could tell us a little bit more on uh, where the, the reform of the judiciary and anti-corruption institutions stand, since we have both delved into this uh, quite at length uh, in our paper on, on rule of law reform. Irina? Thank you, Christina. Uh, I pretty much agree with Manuel, and it's a bit paradoxical because uh, fighting corruption and um, improving judiciary was one of the key points of, uh, during the Lansky campaign, and he basically failed on those. So we, we saw some uh, reform activities on his side. For instance, he submitted an important law in um, autumn to relaunch uh, or to reshuffle uh, two important institutions in judiciary, the High Council of Justice and the um, uh, High uh, Qualific Qualification Commission. Uh, these institutions are actually uh, in responsible for reshuffling the whole judicial corps, which would be really important for Ukraine. And because the law gave too much powers to the High Council of Justice, this institution basically hijacked the reform. Moreover, on the ground, we saw really strange developments like the uh, chairman of the Kiev um, District Administrative Court, uh, Volk, was reinstalled in January uh, to his position. Um, uh, although uh, he has really bad background and it was um, pointed out by anti-corruption activists um, um, and Zelensky never even commented on this. And after the constitutional court uh, uh, ruled the reform of the judiciary, Zelensky initiated as unconstitutional. So most, most provisions were actually canceled. He also didn't react. So basically we saw that Zelensky uh, didn't take any political leadership over this issue. He uh, didn't have a strategy. He didn't commit himself. He didn't demonstrate any commitment to carry out this reform. And in terms of the corruption, most institutions were established before Zelensky came. We saw some improvements under Zelensky, for instance, the National uh, um, uh, Agency for Countering Corruption um, improved its work and uh, cooperation between NABU and the high anti-corruption prosecution uh, and, um, is improved. Uh, but still, uh, he's, uh, the, fact, the way that he fired Yavoshapka and appointed Benediktova um, uh, as a head of the prosecution that he fired recently Maxim Nefyodov, who was behind the Prozoro system, which was recognized as the best system, one of the best systems for public procurements. He was the head of the customs service. He was also fired without uh, further explanations, basically. Uh, so we don't see that he has a strategy, he has a vision, um, and he hasn't achieved really much or anything, actually, in these two domains uh, since his presidency. Thank you, Irina. Um, Katarina, since uh, SGUA is uh, very much uh, on the topic of the judiciary reform, anti-corruption uh, reform as well, um, what do you think? Uh, do, you, do you agree with this assessment of Manuel and, and Irina? And also maybe even a more important question here is, you know, what does overall Zelensky's track record so far say about the prospects of keeping the momentum for reform for the next one to two 
uh, years. Okay, sorry, I'm unmuting myself. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to be briefer this time. Uh, I very much agree with the assessment of, uh, of Manuel. I, I, I don't think I agree with the statement of Irina that he has not achieved anything in this area. I think that's a superficially harsh uh, judgment, I would say. And I mentioned some of the areas that, uh, that uh, uh, he, he, he made. And frankly, uh, getting, getting the banking law, which is directly going against the key oligarchic interest, cost him politically a lot, and he did it. He did it under pressure from the IMF and from all of us, but, uh, but he did it. So I would, I would stay away from really very, very uh, black and white uh, judgments like that. But I would like to point to something that Manuel mentioned, which is the uh, very much something that is a problem in Ukraine currently, and that's the personal versus institutional leadership. And I would also add to that and this is a killer for structural reforms, and that's the micromanagement, right? That, okay, this doesn't work, so I'll change it for something else, or I change this boss for that boss. That can work in a, in a, in a medium-sized private company, or you, have, you can change tack, you can change course midway quickly. It's much more complicated to do it with the, with the whole country. So I think this is, uh, uh, this is where I agree with Irina that there is sort of a seeming lack of, of, of uh, really uh, key reform. But now you, your question, I mean, key direction. Uh, but now on your question on the judiciary, I would like to uh, stop at two of your uh, comments, uh, of your recommendations of the very, very rich uh, analysis that, that you have provided. One is to say we should be, we should be uh, uh, conditioning, uh, conditioning uh, uh, rule of law reform or, or our financial uh, support uh, by rule of law reforms. This is something that has been happening for the last, since 2014 and even before, but in the, with every single program, whether it was EU, whether it was the IMF, whether it was the World Bank, etc. So this is happening. I think what is important for the donor community to recognize, it's not a coincidence that in the new member states or the member states that have been around for 15 years now in the EU, it's not a coincidence that the one area, which is the one sector, the one area that continues to be a problem till this day is the judiciary. And this is where I think it's important to start saying that we as the Western community made the mistake of pushing the countries to introduce independence of the institutions before reforming them, before and started talking about independence and not talking about accountability. Because what is missing there, this was the missing element and now everybody complains about the High Council of Justice because it became a captured uh, captured uh, uh, self-serving institution, but it was our pressure that the High Council of Justice and the similar councils of justice in every other country in the East, the Balkans, the current uh, new member states, this was under Western pressure without understanding how deeply dysfunctional the, the, the judiciaries were and that you first needed to reform them before making them untouchable. And that's the result. This is what we are trying to fix. And this is a generational change. In Slovakia, there are now positive signs after, after 20 or 30 years. It took that long. So it's naive to think that it's going to take one or two years in Ukraine. Yeah, thank you very I'll much, Katarina. Uh, and, and you're raising very good points, particularly about the, the independence before reform. I think this is a problem across uh, the, the, uh, the region. We see it in Moldova as well, quite, uh, quite stark. But Exactly. But this leads us to the second block where I would like to start with Susan and ask you, you know, now that we've seen what was achieved, what's not achieved, and also the stumbling blocks uh, that, that are coming in more gradually, but at a faster pace, who's actually steering the reform process today in, in Ukraine? And here, a more particular question that I would like to ask 
is the sandwich so-called strategy or 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 you know effect depending on who talks about this is it is it still working in ukraine can we still say that it's the international development partners and the reformers that are based you know in ukraine working together mostly civil society organizations that are driving the the reform process or do we see uh, other trends today susan uh, thank you, Christina. Um, well, I think with regard to the question about steering, uh, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily so much steering going on. And I think that has to do with a point that's already been raised about strategy, that actually what uh, Zelensky and his team uh, are largely missing in, in many areas is, is a strategy and that there's more of a um, desire to achieve quick results and to act in a kind of ad hoc uh, manner. So we have important actors. I mean, obviously the presidential administration is an important actor in, in many, if not most areas. We have, uh, we have a government which, has, which is very sort of unbalanced in terms of the, the power of the various ministries, but where you have certain powerful ministries like the interior ministry, uh, which is still under Avakov. We have the oligarchs uh, to which we will come a bit later. Uh, but I would say these actors, their primary focus is not on reforms. And then we have actors uh, like the, the National Reforms Council, which are uh, sort of whose uh, potential for influence is very questionable and which at this point is basically ended up as a place to park Mikhail Saakashvili after it was not possible to get him into the government. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't really see uh, this steering happening uh, very much. And we also see uh, massive personnel changes over the course of time, which are really not conducive to um, uh, reform going on in any continuous fashion, particularly uh, with the change of government, right? From, from Hancharuk only after, after only six months to the Shmihal government, um, where we've also seen since then uh, ch various changes in ministers. So all of this focus on, on, on personnel shifting people in and out is, is really um, not at all conducive to some kind of, of reform agenda that is actually steered and strategic. Uh, and with regard to the sandwich question, I mean, this, this, this method that worked quite well um, previously under Poroshenko with the external actors on the one side and the reform actors in Ukraine, including civil society on the other, I think um, has been weakened significantly uh, for several reasons. First of all, um, the external actors are still there, but in, in the Ukrainian context, um, some of the civil society actors like the reanimation package of reforms and others are, are also there, but they, their influence and their potential for impact has, has been weakened. And also some of the reform elements like, like the um, uh, members of parliament who were very much working with these civil society organizations uh, are, are also gone. So this part of the, of the, of the sandwich um, is in a weaker position. And I would say that the second thing is that there's less tolerance among the ruling elite uh, right now for this type of external intervention. We've seen um, these references to sort of the sort of Siata, the children of, of George Soros. We've seen um, criticism uh, uh, about uh, sort of intervention from outside in processes that are seen as needing to be taken control of by Ukraine. So I think there's a certain among certain members of the elite, there's a somewhat different attitude uh, than before, uh, which also has an impact on the effectiveness of this sandwich approach. Thanks a lot, Susan. And since both you and, and uh, Katarina have already started referring to, uh, and Manuel as well, to the role of oligarchs, Manuel, I want to you know, to let you develop a little bit on this idea. How do you assess their power today on Ukrainian politics? Do you see it as strengthening? Uh, if so, why? And what kind of interests are currently uh, most at stake for them? Mm. Thank you. So I'm tempted to see it as strengthened, but actually this would be not really fair. I think my assessment is more that it is the same like before. And this is already, of course, uh, a a bad uh, one year after coming into office a result for Zelensky, but it is quite funny, especially regarding the COVID pandemia. The situation was reminding me to the beginning of the war a bit. Yeah? In a situation where you don't know how to steer the country anymore, you have the uh, regional oligarchs, the 
lords, the regional lords, who are asked by the president to organize uh, the crisis. And I think this is a clear signal for what has happened before as well. My assessment is that uh, Zelensky um, has a strategy. He wants to be reelected. Uh, when he got in office, nobody was sure if he really wanted to stay in the office really long. I think it's clear that he wants to be reelected. And uh, he doesn't matter too much about how. Um, and he tries to do it by power politics in a classical manner. And uh, he's trying to, you know, like stand on different uh, groups, uh, especially in the eastern sources of the country, and trying to steer them the way that uh, his. Uh, his um, electoral base is, is, is still there. So we see that uh, he's making a deal with Ahmetov clearly. On the same time, he's also uh, focusing to other actors from the old um, uh, uh, Partia of Regions uh, block from the old Yanukovych times and the reformists are really weakened. On the other hand, if we are honest, also Mr. Poroshenko had a clear deal with Mr. Ahmetov and other really, really, really fishy oligarchs in the east and the southeast of the country. So it is not a real new situation. Interesting is that uh, the winning turn of uh, Kolomoisky, which seemed to be um, uh, um, the office overtake of um, Zelensky, is to a certain extent sure that his power is extended, but it is not a clear, you know, uh, governing through of Mr. Kolomoisky. And obviously also, Mr. Lensky is trying to um, have other oligarchs in his, in his team to a certain extent to have kind of balance of powers in there. My assessment is this is classical way of Ukrainian politics and with a young face only. In Germany, we say old, uh, uh, old wine and new uh, Schläuchen, so some of the better English fluent speakers can translate it. Um, this is more or less my assessment. And um, to be fair, you know, this has always been this way, but also to be fair, this is one of the major, major problems of Ukraine. Um, and uh, I think that I mean, to a certain extent, you will have to play with oligarchs as well if you want to reform the country, but not in this manner of the president is deciding and he's talking to a group of people what is to be decided. But uh, perhaps sometimes you need to accept that in parliament you have lobbyists from different oligarchic groups but anyway, you have to treat the parliament really well, like a real institution, to get in a later turn uh, the parliament with a self esteem who can also fight against oligarchs. But not in this way. I'm sitting around the table and with the real powerful guys on the side. Thanks, Manuel. Um, here I want to move on from your idea that the oligarchs are still there. They're not going anywhere. Uh, the way how we assess their power strengthening or weakening, weakening it's still uh, not, not, not clear, not defined. You say it's still, it's, it's more or less the same as, as it used to be. But this has always been a, a, a problem for the reform process going forward. So here, Katarina, I would like you to come in and tell us how do we help the Ukrainians, you know, to help overcome this veto power of the vested interest, since the country has committed to its uh, European path, to its European future. However, we do have domestic stakeholders very much invested in keeping the status quo. How can we uh, help uh, the, the, the Ukrainians, the, the reformers, to, to be able to overcome uh, this veto power of, of oligarchs? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm smiling because when I was listening to to uh, Manuel, uh, I must say that that would be for a separate uh, separate webinar discussion about financial interests and their impact on capturing policy making in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, in the U.S. I mean, I think that one needs to. Uh, I think that with everything that's coming out about uh, various uh, various influences, one again, I think we should acknowledge that that influence of uh, money on politics is is not something that is uh, unique to 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 Ukraine. There are some countries that are further uh, that are more evolved, but but certainly Ukraine is not uh, not not alone in this. Uh, even when it compared to, to OECD uh, member states. Um, 
I, I strongly believe, and this is something that, uh, again, uh, needs to be acknowledged what has been done, but there is still a long way to go. The best way to overcome oligarchic interests is competition and introducing competition into the economy and, and actually closing the space for corruption before the corruption occurs. There was a, there was a Chatham House uh, study on that that even quantified it and this was during the Poroshenko times that uh, Ukraine made, took measures that saved 6% of GDP, $6 billion uh, worth of, uh, of, of money that, uh, that uh, was before uh, siphoned off to corrupt uh, means. I mean, the biggest ticket was, was Naftogaz. Uh, so oligarchs are there. It's a, it's a constant struggle, but one thing is very clear and there are studies de demonstrating that they're much poorer than they were before. So they're still there, they have influence, but they are much, much poorer than they were. And the more the economy opens, the more competition there is in the economy, uh, the easier it will be to curb their influence. The one area where we are very concerned uh, is the hold uh, by oligarchs on the media. And that's something where one needs to be uh, very vigilant, especially in the, in the TV uh, sector. And there again, you know, the new media can, can substitute partially, but with the large TV penetration in the population, this is a, this is a complicated matter, especially because it's combined with the very corrosive disinformation influence by the Moscow uh, channels uh, mixing into that. So that combination is very concerning. But I think competition and, and helping decentralization and, and, and uh, uh, as well as, and this is something where a lot of our support goes, is into the watchdogs and the civil society. I mean, we have, we have really invested a lot and, and continue to, to do so. Irina, from an insider's perspective, do you agree with, uh, with Katarina's assessment, strengthening competition and closing space for, for corruption with a very important focus also on the, on the media environment? How, how do you see um, you know, strategies for overcoming uh, the veto power of, of oligarchs? Mm -hmm. I very much agree with Katarina. I would also add here, it's maybe a different side of uh, strengthening competition creating and strengthening institutions that are responsible for equal access to public resources and to decision making. Actually avoiding the, the situations when some people, some interests have better privileged access to certain resources and to decision making. And this is what we have in the form of oligarchs. Uh, and to, to add to this, uh, independent judiciary is also very important because it's an in the impartial arbiter which would um, rule in terms of in cases where the where the where there is a conflict of interest, for instance. Um, but uh, uh, when we come back to practice, of course, it's very difficult. And um, uh, we see, for instance, that Zelensky, if Manuel says that his strategy is to be reelected, if this is the case, uh, then he needs media of oligarchs. And we see how he partnered with Renata Kmetov, whose media channels are very popular and cover Zelensky in a very positive way. And we see that Zelensky, for instance, uh, the pro uh, as a president, he he's, uh, has a big influence over anti-monopoly committee. And he didn't do anything to reform this institution. He reshuffled the personnel there, but in a way which was not positive for this institution. He appointed some people without a competition procedure and uh, people who are linked to him somehow in a personal way to this institution. Uh, this institution uh, never declared the tech, the company of Renata Akhmetov as an anti-monopolist, as a monopolist, although uh, it's pretty obvious that in um, electro energy for its production, this company has a, uh, huge monopoly. Um, so I agree with these components and yes, uh, free media and uh, civil society are very com important components of this uh, fight against oligarchs, but this is a really long-term development uh, 
Thanks um, a lot, Irina. I, I would like now to go very briefly into the last block of questions and we'll probably uh, skip a few, but I would definitely like, Katarina, to give you the floor to tell us how has COVID-19 changed the EU's approach towards supporting Ukraine. It has changed a lot of processes within the Commission, including in how it approaches external support towards partner countries overall for the Eastern Partnership. But what can you tell us more about your support towards Ukraine? How has you changed strategies? Well, I think that we very early on sort of uh, mobilized ourselves. We are now at the, we're this year at the end of us, our seven year funding cycle. EU budget gets uh, uh, programmed or sort of committed in seven year cycles. And so we, we were in a situation where we didn't have new money, so to speak. Although now we are going to get some uh, when the new recovery package that was just announced gets approved. But but uh, in March, we didn't have any, any new resources to deal with, but what we did is we took the programming of this year and looked through all of the programming of the last two years of the unspent funds and, and quickly made it uh, uh, repurposed to, to better address uh, COVID-19 along three areas. One was uh, immediate emergency humanitarian assistance, which is particularly relevant in Ukraine with the worsening humanitarian situation in the East, where the occupied territories don't even allow uh, humanitarian intervention across uh, borders right now. So that needs to be said. Um, the second area was strengthening of the health systems, uh, both, in the, both through pushing to keep the health reform on, on, on track, but also working with the, with the ministry and supporting Ukraine on purchase of uh, equipment, et cetera. We also made Ukraine an associate member of the EU Secur Health Security Committee that was uh, quickly set up uh, after <laughs> that crisis began. And the third area uh, very strongly is support to the economy, providing liquidity uh, we are now working with international financial institutions, EIB, EBRD, others, and the national development banks to reorient, uh, to provide uh, working capital and quick, uh, disbursing, quick disbursing loans. So hopefully, as of the summer, they will be getting an influx uh, of money into the economy. So this was sort of a quick repurposing, as well as supporting continued decentralization and some of our um, other, uh, other programs. We have quickly moved into, into videos and discussions over videos and, and are having uh, negotiations on the, on, on the updates of the association agreement and everything via video. I have my, my jour fix with the deputy prime minister who has now changed for European integration as well uh, uh, over, over video. And we look forward to opening the borders when we will be able to travel. Thank you, Katarina. Manuel, can I close with you this uh, round of, 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 of uh, remarks? And uh, before we get into the Q&A, could you tell us, you know, given the course of reforms that we have discussed uh, and given the domestic developments in Germany, do you see, is there enough ground for significantly improving bilateral relations between Germany and, and Ukraine in the years to come? And if so, in what directions? I think that technically, um, I mean, Germany is one of the biggest donors. Germany is one of the countries with the highest cooperation um, between the administrations and in the reform sector. And Germany is also perhaps the country in Europe, at least, where Ukrainian public opinion is looking at the most. And I think that in all this, um, in all these uh, branches, there is enough potential for increasing, uh, still making it better, doing more. And we have a lot of technical expert in Ukraine. I think in Berlin, we have a lot of critical debate and also critical um, um, public opinion on Ukraine uh, amongst the experts. On the other hand, politically, I see that um, the overall political scene and public opinion, which is not an expert on Eastern Central Europe, on foreign policy, is a bit of tired of uh, Ukraine, of foreign policy at large. And especially if we see at the, the results of the pandemia, this will increase. People will be more um, uh, struggling with themselves and the national answers uh, got stronger. But I think that um, on this field, uh, we look into difficult times. And especially as the trust in Germany is also 
weakened in Ukraine, not only because of the Nord Stream 2 debate, but also because of, in general, because of the feeling that, um, you know, we in Berlin, we are sorry that Zelensky is opening up to Russia on the same hand. We look like opening up to Russia as well. And um, I think this is a difficult task. And in general, we have a situation in Germany, like in many capitals, that foreign policy is uh, losing grounds in the competition with other policy fields, and that the foreign ministries are also losing grounds here. So um, I think, <laughs> saying it quite frankly, uh, it will be really, really important um, who will be the next chancellor and the chancellor candidates by different possible parties. If we have a person there who is uh, engaged and willing for um, pursuing Mother Merkel's cause mainly regarding Ukraine, it will be good news. If we have somebody who is not so much interested about the East or who is perhaps even a more pro-Russian candidate, it might be not so functioning. And I think that in Ukraine, people will look at this quite exactly and our influence, our leverage is Germany in Ukraine will be massively depending on this, also, of course, the person of foreign minister, but uh, I think that in the foreign ministry, it is not so much linked to the person of the minister, what will be the cause of the ministry in general. I think in a chance that this is a bit more. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Manuel, for these closing remarks. I'm sure, I'm really sorry it took a bit longer than we expected, but I hope it was a good uh, back and forward uh, round of questions. I would like now to give the floor to our audience, and I already see uh, two hands raised up, and we will take uh, rounds of questions. So if there are more, just uh, put your hands up or put a sign in the chat box, and I will know that uh, you would like to take the floor. We will start with uh, Mr. Elmar Brock, then we will go to Orisia Lutsevich and uh, Wilfried Gilke, the first uh, three ones. Uh, please introduce yourselves and uh, try to keep your question or comment uh, short. Thank you. Uh, Elmar Brock, you have uh, the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity of these discussions of, I think, uh, good informations. And I would like to say that especially the commission and the task force does a good job. But I think we should all, always remind ourselves that all this reform process, both in the time of Poroshenko and as well now, is uh, done in a war, a war which is waged by Russia directly or indirectly, and that uh, internal reform process, but at the same time uh, 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 to have a war in the country is quite difficult and that I think it's a fair judgment. I have met, uh, I have had a discussion with President Zelensky, and I think that he wants to go in the right direction with all the difficulties within his own staff and the you know, whole uh, surroundings. But uh, I think there is one was done one mistake with civil servants like, but parliamentarians perhaps not. It's this fast track legislation, which has destroyed his part of uh, a big majority and where the reform oriented, young people co connected to NGOs uh, were not ready to follow anymore. And I think he is the weakening of Zelensky uh, now. And uh, I have two points just uh, where perhaps uh, Katarina can tell us more about the developments. The first thing is the development of local government. We know that Zelensky's party has no grassroots. And there was very much the method to have more influence, both on the budget side as well as that the control can be done by the presidential administration to the regions, uh, that this uh, is not helping to have a broader pluralistic development. And the second one is what is the status of the land reform, which is first progress, but on the second time, if that is possible, it might be that the oligarchs, after they have got in the 90s all the industrial sites, uh, that they can get now even more the lands, uh, the, the cultural lands. Thank you very much, sir. So and two questions, we will take them, uh, we will give the floor to Katarina after we take two more questions. Borisia, very nice to see you, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Christine, and congratulations to you and Irina on the important paper. I'm looking forward to reading it. I think it's the key sector, definitely, that uh, ob obstructs Ukraine's prosperity. 
with FDI, with internal competition, with many things we discussed. But I would like to um, raise two points. Um, one, we clearly see a rapture of this cooperation between civil society and reformers in government, especially Zelensky's team, is not really reaching out to people who have ideas, and many of them I see here on the screen. It was always European Union who was in a way pushing for inclusion of civil society in structural reforms through uh, the offices of reforms. And we do see, for example, with COVID, how much mobilization there was again from civil society and SMEs to solve again, you know, the, uh, to, to stick the holes in the Ukraine's healthcare. Do, do you think, Katerina, something can be done about it to make sure to facilitate this dialogue? Because I think Ukraine loses a lot. And the second question also be to you. Uh, it's about uh, right now we do see this prosecute the, the efforts to prosecute Poroshenko. You know, and and I I, I see deja vu. You know, I, we we talked about the unreformed judiciary, and um, is Poroshenko is is Zelensky stepping in the you know Yanukovych's mistakes? This may cause a, a serious trouble, as I would imagine, with the international partners if they go for the selective prosecution of de facto opposition. What is your reading on the situation? Thank you so much. Thank you, Arisia. Wilfred, you have the floor. On to you. Yes, thank you very much for the great inputs. Uh, very important, everything. I would like to elaborate a little bit in a comment uh, what, what, what is concerning Zelensky. I think we really have to ask is if he, from the start, really wanted Western-style reforms. What we see in law enforcement is a ongoing concentration of power, even against constitutional sentences. When I look at the DBR, the, uh, the Bureau of State Investigations, and I think uh, Zelensky has a problem that he really thinks one person and his trusted friends, what I call the Quartal Camarilla, can make really everything from above. I think that is one problem. The second problem is that we really have a comeback of Yanukovych people. And that is not only true for certain positions as we have now in the new government, but also when we look at the ministries like the Ministry for Economy, when we look at the staff behind the deputy minister, people who were silent uh, for years are coming back. And I think we really have to pay attention on this but because actually the concentration of power is challenging um, the division of powers in Ukraine. Uh, the, my question is on prosecution. We spoke already about uh, judiciary, but I think a real problem also is a prosecution. And if we have no prosecution, we also have no anti-corruption fight. My question to Katarina Maternova, hello, nice, nice to see you, <laughs> um, is, uh, as I know, uh, the EU advisory mission is, or has also stepped in to support uh, the reform. Now we see this, that Mrs. Venediktova, the new general prosecutor, is already using discretional powers, by the way, to change the rules of selection of people for uh, administrative positions. Um, my question to you is, um, can you a little bit elaborate uh, what for you uh, are the achievements of the prosecution reform so far, and uh, how you um, make the dialogue uh, actually with Ms. Venediktova and, and how, how give you signals that if they want to go that way, a way more against transparency, against institutionalism, what will be the reaction from your side? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. Thank, Thank you, Wilfred. Uh, we will stop here. We'll take the first three questions. If there are more uh, people who'd like to uh, ask questions, please raise your hands and I will take you in the next round. Most of the questions were for you, Katarina, but maybe others would like to intervene. Maybe, Irina, you'd also like to comment on Wilfred's uh, question on the prosecution. Um, Katarina, would you like to start? I'll, I'll try telegraphically. Uh, so, uh, hi, nice to, nice to hear you, Elmar. Um, we miss you in Ukraine. Um, I very much agree with your assessment that uh, he, he lost ground with a lot of the parliamentarians by, by bypassing the regular parliamentary procedures in the, in the fall. And, but now I think the parliamentary groups are getting a little more confident and that's part of the reason why there is uh, not as easy to get, uh, get majority on, on, uh, on key legislation as it, was, uh, as it was before. The local government I think is very 
what uh, what also Susan mentioned, one of the key uh, achievements was to to defuse the attacks on the decentralization reform uh, for now. I mean, they may come back again, but I think the decentralization reform, which in my view is one of the key achievements in Ukraine over the last few years, is continuing. We will see how Zelensky will fare in the in the local elections that will come. I think that uh, I assume that he will be having ties uh, tie ups with with key uh, lo- regional uh, legion, regional uh, lords in key regions. I, th- I think that would uh, that is something that one can one can predict. But I I honestly think that the decentralization has taken hold in the Ukrainian minds when you travel around the country. That hopefully that will that will withstand. Now on the land reform, uh, the land law was passed uh, against a lot uh, and and in fact uh, cost uh, cost Zelensky a lot politically. Um, early, earlier, I think, in March or April. And it's not passed to the extent that uh, we would all like to see with the international community because it doesn't, doesn't open up uh, the, 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 the land market to the extent that it's sort of very gradual. But I think that one needs to realize what a historical change this is, that there will be market in land. Now, what we are working on with, with our, our colleagues in the various other institutions, the World Bank, IMF, etc., is to push for the second batch of laws that will provide the safeguards on land ownership uh, at, at local level, at national level, etc., to avoid what, what uh, you were alluding to. Uh, because we are all very much interested uh, in, 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 in making sure that it does, the land doesn't get sh- captured by a few. And uh, we actually are putting uh, quite a lot of uh, resources behind uh, land reform in exchange for having the safeguards uh, on, on land ownership. Now, um, uh, to Orisia, hi Orisia, uh, on the facilitating the dialogue, I think that we, I think through COVID and with all the changes, I think we are now seeing weight, uh, mobilization in the civil society in, uh, in a sense. And what we do is we, first of all, very much politically encourage the dialogue. We structure that into each of our programs very systematically. And as I mentioned, we also finance, uh, I mean, we moved from finance, we actually did quite a bit of reform in the way we do civil society funding to move away from funding to supporting it, to supporting uh, small through pro- pro- not only program but operational grants to sort of make the civil society through our support uh, more more vibrant. So that's something that we we work on. Uh, yes, I agree that there is less of a sandwich effect as Susan was also mentioning compared to the to the to the previous previous government, but. Uh, I think the best we can do is to indeed uh, support as much as we can the, 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 the civil society actors. Now on the prosecution reform, uh, maybe Irina can come in as well. I mean, yes, we were all very uh, disappointed when Ruslan Ryaboshapka was, uh, was dismissed because we had worked very closely with him and supporting him in the, in the reform. And I in fact think that the way he reformed the uh, Prosecutor General Office itself was quite impressive, and uh, and uh, all I can say is that we will continue. We will continue engaging with Ukraine. You know, we are partners with Ukraine uh, for bad or for good. So we are, as I said in one of the previous seminars last week, is that we are critical partners. So we are partners. We will continue supporting, but we will also continue pointing the areas where where we are not not very satisfied with the developments. Irina, would you like to come in as well a bit on the prosecution? Yes, thank you. I will add a bit. I agree with Wilfred that in terms of fighting corruption, prosecution, uh, effective and independent prosecution is also a very important element. Yes. And uh, um, yes, it's, 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 we have to recognize um, that Zelensky gave carte blanche to Ryaboshapka, which is very positive to reshuffle the, the personnel, the prosecutors. We know that there was an attempt on the Poroshenko to do the same when Shokin was the prosecutor general, and this all failed. So it's not an easy process to, um, to, um, 
to uh, um, conduct the attestation, attestation and uh, ensure that all perceived users um, have integrity. And Dravushapka did this at least at the central level. And it's a pity that under Venediktova, we see that it's really, uh, we see that prosecutors that were fired are coming back, uh, they are winning in courts and coming back uh, to their positions. And Venediktova is facilitating this process. Uh, so this is very negative, of course. Um, and uh, um, I would add also a prosecution of Poroshenko is also a very negative trend. We observe under Zelensky, we see that there are no grounds for this. And the bear is basically used as an instrument for political fight, uh, which is very, which is a pity, of course. Yeah. Thank you. I see two more uh, people who would like to ask questions. Um, if there are more, please make yourself visible. I will now give the word to uh, Victor Savino, please. Uh, hello, it's probably about me. I'm Victor Zemetin from the Arsenal Post Center, and if you allow me, I have just a brief remark uh, about the people's assessment of the first Zelensky's year in his office. Uh, we have already conducted uh, our own uh, work on this issue, and uh, it will be published in a couple of weeks. And we have uh, conducted two uh, service one of the uh, public opinion survey and another one of the uh, expert surveys and uh, we have the very interesting results first of all uh, we have uh, i believe a general trend that majority of people think that uh, the general situation is going on a uh, wrong direction uh 49% of people uh, say so and only 29% of people uh, say that uh, the situation develops in the right direction and after the uh, uh, mr zelensky's election in uh, september of 2019 the figures were completely different uh, 57% of people at that time thought that the uh, situation develops in the right direction and uh, about 17% in their own direction. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that if we ask people about their assessment of the change, of the change in the situation in several spheres, uh, they answered that the situation is going worse in the economy of the country, in their own economic welfare, in the level of democracy, in the international image of the country, in the rule of, of law, in the health care, in the pension system, in the wages, and in the uh, level of press and tariffs and in the uh, behavior of the uh, power uh, before the citizens. Mr. Zemetin, and yes. also if you have a question, could you, could you tell us what's your question and to who it is addressed, please? Uh, well, uh, as I said, I, I just uh, wanted you to, uh, to know so some uh, maybe news figures of the situation which can uh, only uh, help you in your assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for this uh, input on the, on the opinion polls. Uh, I would like again to try to give the word to Viktor Sabinok. I see you're having your uh, hand raised. Would you like to take the floor, please? Yes, thank you very much and thanks to all uh, the speakers for interesting presentations and inputs. Uh, my name is Viktor Savinok. I'm a PhD student at Maria Curie Sklodowska University in Lublin, Poland. And my question is uh, concerned uh, the, uh, so to say, ideology of uh, current ruling party, the servant of the people, because uh, since uh, actually uh, the uh, takeover of, uh, of power in Ukrainian parliament, this party is, uh, so to say, struggling to develop uh, its own ideological views, because before 
uh, the parliamentary elections in 2019, uh, it classified itself as a libertarian party. And then in November 2019, uh, we heard from uh, incumbent leader of the party, Alexander Kondyenko, that it's uh, something in the middle uh, between the liberal ideology and the social ideology. Uh, and now uh, it defines itself as a party working within the framework of so-called Ukrainian centrism. So um, maybe the, uh, the speakers might uh, somehow try to elaborate on uh, um, what, how this uh, actually ideological standpoints of this party could look like and can actually this party be labeled as uh, to some extent uh, populist political force or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, maybe Susan, maybe you could take this question later. We have two more questions. Uh, Boris Ginsburg first and then Milan. Nietzsche. Hello, um, my name is Boris Ginsburg. I just recently finished my master's studies in political science uh, at the FU Berlin and now uh, Berlin and now I'm um, uh, preparing my research design for my future dissertation. Um, I've got two questions to all speakers. Um, first of all, um, to the role of the oligarchs in Ukraine. Um, we, I think that we, we, uh, we use the term oligarch too often and we do not always define what we mean by the term oligarch uh, in order to, to uh, go forward with the reforms and to tackle the uh, counterattacks by the oligarchs or even to include the oligarchs for the reforms, we, we need to know who are the oligarchs. And so I would like to ask the speakers if somebody could please define the term oligarch, because um, is it a person who is outside the politics, but who, has, uh, who is uh, not holding any office, but who has uh, a lot of influence on the politics? So is, or has it to be a person like, for example, Poroshenko, who was an oligarch, became a politician? Um, I would be very glad if somebody could um, clarify Thank you. this. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, Milan, you have the floor. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'll be brief as the previous comments were um, a longer one. I have two questions looking forward for the next few weeks and months. One is about the rumor that uh, Minister of Interior Avakov will be dismissed in coming days. Um, what would that mean for the government? And second question is about the likely opposition to Zelensky emerging from powerful regional leaders or mayors. Actually, the question would be, except Poroshenko, where do you see a credible opposition merging to Zelensky in, his, in the next period of his, of his rule in the Ukraine centrist pro-European uh, um, position? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Milan. I would like to also ask uh, two more questions, one to Irina and one to Susan. Irina, um, while Ukraine has clearly declared its, its choice for European uh, future, uh, as in Germany, as in Europe, there are voices in Ukraine that signal fatigue with the EU, with the fact that it is not reciprocating enough or is not doing as much as it could on various portfolios. Uh, uh, such as uh, Donbass or trade. Um, can you tell us a little bit of more about the moods uh, towards EU? Can we state that the EU is uh, starting losing a bit credibility in Ukraine? This was also something that uh, Manuel has referred to in his uh, latest, uh, in his final uh, intro remarks. And for Susan, do we, do we see Ukraine pivoting away from the West? I think this is a question that starts emerging, seeing the economic ties and Zelensky going beyond Ukraine, trying to, to forge relations with, with other economic partners. Should we expect this trade consolidating or is there nothing to really worry about? Um, depending on who would like to take the floor first, uh, there were a uh, question on um, on the ideological direction of the Servant of the People Party, who are the oligarchs, uh, how do we define it? Um, I think this is a, a 
a problem that always comes up uh, uh, when it comes to, to definitions. I don't know if we want to go into, into that uh, direction. There was a comment on um, directions uh, where Ukraine is going and the societal moods uh, during Poroshenko, uh, that being higher than under Zelensky currently. Uh, and a question on Avakov as well as who is the credible opposition today. Who would like to, to take the floor? So perhaps um, as the negative uh, pessimist might start so that the other ones can be more optimistic. Um, regarding the credible opposition, before uh, you were leaning out to focus this on the pro-West, pro-EU forces, the answer was clear, quite clear, I think. And this is Mitri uh, Shuk. And I think there is no other credible opposition yet. And this might also lead into a situation that we think that Zelensky is the one guarantee guy for westbound of Ukraine, even if he is leaning more towards old structures, which are, if they're not by themselves pro-Russian, but coming from this old um, Partia Regenev uh, base, they are clearly more influenced by Russian interests. Um, I think this might be the situation to come. Anyway, um, I think that this is uh, to a certain extent also caused by the fatigue, which was mentioned just, and that, you know, the, the trust in the political concept of binding Ukraine towards the West has undermined by a kind of reluctance from the European Union to give a perspective. And then also by this, what was happening in US with Ukraine being a major part of the campaign with Mr. Trump. So that also the trust in the US administration or the US strategic partner has been weakened. And then of course, in Central Europe, you always ask who might be, which might be the other partners. And um, I think we should be in, in Europe and in Germany, especially, we should be aware of that we might lose Ukraine much more early than we recognize that we're going to lose it. Because, I mean, we also see this, like Ms. Matanova was saying, in other regions, parts of the region, like in on the Western Balkans or in Moldova, um, Christina was referring to that sometimes the political elites or also the political system is still saying, we want to go to European Union, we are West binding. But the mindset is already changing and the belief and the, the push for reforms is already changing. I already see Ukraine on, on this, uh, at this um, crossing point and clearly to say not only because uh, of the Ukrainians, also because of us. Yeah? So not only is a criticism towards Ukraine, but also is a criticism uh, to ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, here's a follow-up question. So um, uh, can you comment a bit on the cohesion of Ukraine as a country? Is it consolidating under, under Zelensky? Just a year ago, we discussed uh, a lot of tensions between uh, the West, the East and the Southern uh, regions. I mean, this is difficult to really assume from, uh, from Germany. Uh, and I think it's also difficult to assume from um, from Ukraine side. Um, he had this concept of bringing everybody together. And we remember this famous picture with the UPA soldier and, and the uh, partisan woman uh, of, the, of the partisans of the uh, Red Army forces, so to say. But to a certain extent, I mean, this can be political marketing and he's really great in doing this. But Ukraine is clearly um, a, a political sphere which is consolidated. But of course, in this shifting times, in this shifting world, um, it is not so easy to find a common center point for the society for, to focus on. This is already true in Germany or in France or in the US. And uh, we don't see yet this polarization as strong as it was before the revolution or directly after the revolution. And Zelensky is clearly trying to steer in the middle somehow to make it feasible for everybody. But I think that this will not work out 
in the end, in the end, in the post-socialistic countries, you need something like ideology, not in the sense of green program or social democratic German party ideology, but of um, what is in the end the visionary aim of cohesion of the society. Thanks, thanks, Manuel. Have answer on this. Thank you. Irina, would you like to jump in here with a few comments on the questions that have been raised? Yes, um, on ideology, I would say that um, because the basic state building problems are not solved in Ukraine, the whole discussion is, of course, about these issues for fighting corruption, independent judiciary. So, so, um, so, it's, it, so uh, I would uh, analyze Ukrainian parties along this line. Are they pro-reform or against reform, pro-European, against European? Uh, so this, this would be, for me, the major denominators, whereas ideo ideological issues it's important to debate on them, but they are less of less importance uh, importance uh, at the current situation in the current situation in Ukraine. I would like to comment on um, Milan's question questions. Um, uh, I think the dismissal of Avaka would be a very positive move. The the uh, his dismissal has been demanded by civil society for a long time, and it was a major. It was really surprising that he, he said that he stayed in the new government and, and appointed in March. Not surprising, but uh, uh, it was somehow not um, not something civil society or democratic community in Ukraine wanted. Uh, the, the question is, of course, who, who would be the, the, an alternative? But I think if there is a, an open competition and uh, a merit-based competition, with the, the, it would be possible to find the person because the way he monopolized the powers and uh, it's really um, and the way. Um, the, we see a lot of dis, uh, misuses uh, in the um, in the places of detainment, and we don't see that he is doing anything. So it really would be a positive move. And um, in terms of opposition to Zelensky, it's a very important question, of course. And uh, this is a, a problem that there is no alternative to basically to him and to his party. Uh, at, the, at the point of a parliamentary election, the Golos party was seen as such an alternative, but but I don't see it has a lot of chances now. And uh, yes, uh, due to decentralization, the, some mayors um, become quite strong and local elected authorities become strong. This might be a, a source of opposition in the future, but at the moment, I don't see really any particular trends on that. On EU credibility, I wouldn't actually say that the EU is losing credibility. We see that popular support for the EU is actually increasing. Uh, or more or less, it, it remains stable starting from 2014, but it's actually increasing slowly even. Uh, moreover, I think due to uh, this close cooperation with the European Union, this deep entrenched contacts at different, among different professional groups uh, in the society, uh, they have become really deep and um, uh, it's, it's really, the EU has become uh, even a domestic power in, in terms of Ukrainian reform process. Uh, so I, I don't think that EU is losing credibility. It's so much entrenched already in Ukraine and different levels that it's really, I think it's, it's meaning um, and influence is actually growing. So it, it will stay like this and, and will grow. Um, and on oligarchs, there was a question I would add, I would say that, um, there are various um, definitions, but of course, uh, if we see that somebody has a monopolist position in some sector of economy, has uh, um, unproportional access to decision making, to resources like Ukrainian oligarchs have, and of course, media resources, this would, this would be um, like basic characteristics. Uh, taking an office is not really something. Uh, they tried to, to become parliamentarians before Ukrainian oligarchs, but this was really in the 90s, early 2000s. It's not the case anymore. So uh, there are many other ways to influence politics. Uh, how you could, And that's what Ukrainian oligarchs are doing. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Susan, would you like to uh, be next to comment on some of the questions? Sure, thank you. Uh, I will pick up maybe on two points. Um, just for one thing to follow up on what Irina said about ideology, I think it's important to take into account that over the past uh, 20 to 30 years, we just have not seen the development of political parties in Ukraine based on ideology. We've seen uh, essentially uh, parties that are usually grouped around one person and, and that person's uh, kind of uh, support group or, or group of people that, that benefit from that person um, having a certain amount of power. And uh, there have been 
if you look at sort of how the parties call themselves and, and then look at their programs, you see that actually the programs tend to be very, very similar on, on a lot of points. And so this ideological spectrum simply hasn't developed and I don't really see that happening um, with uh, the current um, um, ruling party uh, servant of the people. I don't see that um, this kind of ideological crystallization is taking place. And in fact, it would be rather surprising because the party is kind of a, um, a semulsurium of, of, you know, a variety of different um, uh, uh, people from different backgrounds with different goals, with different ideological uh, standpoints, if they have any. So uh, I don't think that we can really expect this, this to emerge from this party. Uh, and then with your, with regard to your question, uh, Christina, about uh, whether uh, there's kind of a shift away from the West in terms of uh, Ukrainian foreign policy, I would say, I, th I think it's an interesting question at this time, because what we see coming out, at least of the foreign ministry under Kuleba, is this sort of uh, decide, decision to pivot to Asia, right, at least uh, on a rhetorical level right now. And I think it's probably partly linked to the the um, idea, the approach of Zelensky to bring in further investments. So it, it could also be a way of strengthening the profile of the ministry and, and of, of showing that one is doing something, one is being active, one is pursuing a new direction. At the, at, at the same time, I don't think the base for doing this is particularly strong in terms of the existing links, except in, in maybe a few areas. And, and also, as we talked about before, um, like, uh, the strategic thinking is not really pronounced. So if the idea is to have quick results, that may not happen. And that that kind of approach may in fact quickly be abandoned. We don't know. But in the meantime, I think foreign policy resources of Ukraine are, are really limited. So the attention to the West might in fact suffer if this pivot to Asia is really pursued in any uh, intensity. And I, I think there would be more likely the EU that might that might suffer from that lack of attention than the US because uh, even though there's uh, there are these problems arising from the impeachment attempts um, regarding Donald Trump and the focus on the, his conversations with Zelensky and and this whole complex of issues uh, still the US remains very important for Ukraine in terms of, of security so I'm not saying that they're going to abandon a, a EU integration but it might be to some extent uh, deep prioritized if they really decide to go for this pivot to Asia in any real sense and, and also if the reforms uh, start to go off track, which would make European integration more challenging. Thanks, Thank Susan. Um, Katarina, since we're closing or we're, we're approaching to closing this, uh, this discussion, I was wondering if you'd like to pick up on any of the points that we discussed today and maybe make some concluding remarks uh, for, for this conversation. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, just two points. Uh, one, uh, and, and uh, I take very good note of Manuel's uh, 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 not very optimistic view on where Ukraine will, uh, will be on public minds or policymakers' minds in Germany. This is indeed uh, uh, concerning because uh, I think that just looking at the map, uh, Ukraine is a strategic partner to Europe and it's in everybody's interest in Europe that Ukraine stays firmly anchored to the West. I think it's in our interest, not only in the interest of Ukraine. And, and I take the point that it's going to be complicated to continue making the case, but uh, certainly uh, in terms of EU policy, this, there is an unwavering commitment to uh, Ukraine. Uh, in April, we had the Foreign Affairs Council, where, as you know, Russia was making uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, approaches to EU you know, um, member to the EU and EU member states individually, saying, "Look, because of COVID, we need they need sanctions relief," and there was a resounding no to that notion. And, and saying that the sanctions are firmly uh, tied to the territorial integrity and, uh, of, 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 of Ukraine. So uh, I, I, I take the point that the case will be made hard to, to make, but I think we need to withstand that because we are each other's uh, strategic uh, partners. 
Now, on the point that Susan was now and, and Irina were commenting on the uh, public mood, in terms of the official uh, pronouncements, it's less, EU is less of a priority than it was under Poroshenko. But when you then go down to the to the contacts and to the discussions, that's very much not the case. I mean, there is very, very active uh, debate across sectors. We just, uh, next week, we have a planning meeting of the next EU-Ukraine summit, which will be early October with the, with the cabinet of the president of the European Council, Mr. Michel. So there is a lot uh, happening and, and a lot of active uh, interaction. So yes, on the, on the, on the um, sort of signaling side, it may not be as, as visible, but in the day-to-day -day, day -day contacts, I think it's very, very, uh, continues to be very strong. And I think that the COVID response that we were able to mobilize under a branding of Team Europe, I think made uh, quite an impact in Ukraine because we have a recent poll where the EU is uh, the largest or the largest shared of respondents uh, believes that the EU is the first foreign entity to assist Ukraine in the recovery from COVID, even before the WHO and, and strongly before the US, China or others. So. I, th I would I would also say what Irina was saying that it's sort of taken for granted and and when it comes to a crisis we were able to mobilize quickly and communicate about it and I think it was uh, very much appreciated and I hope that that sentiment will stay with us for a while. Thanks a lot, Katarina. Um, all I could say as concluding remarks is that there are probably more questions than answers uh, for after this discussion, as after most of the discussions on Ukraine, I still think it was uh, a good uh, reflection on where we stand today in terms of domestic actors, in terms of reforms. And of this, we could project what could we expect for the next uh, one to, to two years. Uh, no one expected uh, COVID-19 to be around. So I think uh, we might uh, uh, not be that successful if we speak again on this topic in half a year. Anyways, I would like to thank very much our speakers for joining us today. Thank you, Katarina, Manuel, Susan, and Irina for uh, your very rich uh, uh, comments uh, on, on, on today's topic. And I hope we'll see you again again in, in a different discussion. Thank you also very much for the audience for joining us today and until soon. Bye bye.